So, we're picking it up from a code, a code of ethics, a written code, a written set of ethical principles that we are to follow. Now, in our case, from Oasis, they've given us the canon of ethical principles. Now, print this, you should have this printed out in front of you. There's, um, on the online course, there's uh, a printable reference material in the, this, these pages of the canon of ethical principles from are, are there to print out and for you to look at, and we'll look at it together. Okay, so, we have a code of ethical principles. Now, this is not something that you just do um, when it suits you, when it works, or it depends. When you say it depends, you have to know what rule or code you're going to break before you can say it depends. Like, I'm going to break this, this particular code number four. Because it well it depends you know if it's you know there there is no it depends there is no way to give yourself permission to break these this code of ethics so and in the initial application and when you get your recertification application for renewal it's going to have a this printout of the code of ethics with. A little space next to each one that you are, have to initial to show that you read it. And then at the bottom, you are going to sign it. It's a contract. A binding contract. Judge Judy, I have a contract. Okay, so this is a, an oath, really, that we, we sign off on. Uh, for our initial uh, certification as a case act and for the case act we know. And now, OASIS wants us to have six hours of continuing education on ethics as part of the renewal certification. Hence, this course. Just a little background on, on for myself. I'm an adjunct assistant professor at our local community college here on Long Island. And we have a 350 hours of the standardized curriculum to teach for the case activity. Um, the academic chairperson uh, approached me and asked me if I could write a course, a three-credit college course, 45 uh, continuing education hours, but three-credit college course for our OASIS certification just on ethics, ethics and, and cultural competence. And of course I said, no problem, I'm on it, and uh, spent some time, uh, co-authored it with, with the academic chairperson, wrote a course on ethics and submitted it to the college academic committee uh, and it was approved by the college and it was also approved by OASIS as part of our 350 hour curriculum. So um, I teach, a, I'm the only uh, professor that teaches that ethics course, that's certified to teach that ethics course, but um, I have, as part of the Institute for Learning and Development, I have a 15 hour course on training that I've been teaching under section four and I have really adapted all of that knowledge from the college course and from my institute's 15-hour uh, course in ethics. I've combined, I've really kind of put as much of the most important information into this six-hour online course. And uh, I spent hundreds of hours, hundreds of hours in developing that online course material. Just to me, I can gripe for it. That's not a, that's not a moan, that's not a whine, okay? So, I really did put a lot of work into to designing this online course. But it is serious stuff and Oasis wants us to have it. So here is the can case at Canada Professional Ethics that you have a print out there in front of you and I'm going, you know, you can look at it, but this is something you're going to have to sign off on, an initial that you read, and you know, it's not just something that you do when you feel like it. It's, it's binding. Okay, so. Let's just have a look at the um, at the ethical principles, and you can you can read all of them, right? But just want to point out a couple to you. Who of you, if you're watching this in, this online course as a group, or uh, you're watching it as an individual, 
Who, I'll address it to everybody in the, the class here. Who would like to ruin their career? Who would like to ruin their case at? After all these hours, after all these hours that everybody's taken, and uh, 6,000 hours of work supervision, and pass the ICNRC exam, and then we get recredentialed every, th every three years, we have to get renewal and take this course, and all my course, and it's in the 60 hours. Who wants to throw that all away? Nobody? At home? Okay, I'll show you how to do it easy. Just look at um, five and six, okay? Number five. Must not, repeat, must not engage in relationships with patients, former patients or their significant others, in which there is a risk of exploitation or potential harm to the patient. Remember, primum non non quere. Firstly, do no harm. You must not engage in a relationship with patients, former patients or their significant others, in which there is a risk of exploitation, and we're going to get into a little bit more about that exploitation as we move on to the, the online course, and potential for harm to the patient. If, even if there's a potential for harm to the patient, first do no harm, you can't do it. But you cannot do that, okay? You cannot do that. Number six, must not engage in any sexual activity with current or former patients or their significant others. Repeat, must not engage in any sexual activity with current or former patients or their significant others. Now, okay, so I hear this from KSATs. When we do the training, I do it. I do on-site training and programs for clinical treatment teams. They say, how long does that for? Isn't it, doesn't that like, uh, isn't there a, a sunset term on that, like five years, and then it's okay to date a former patient? The answer is no. It's never going to be all right. That condition, there is no sunset on it. It's forever. You cannot date former patients because there is a, a possibility of exploitation because of they see you as an authority figure, they've trusted you, they like they care about you, they you understood them, and you it's easy to, it would be easy to exploit that. So that is verboten, okay? It's forbidden. Now, let me ask you this. Do you, could you, or do, could it ever happen that you're sitting across from a patient and the patient uh, falls in love with you? That does happen. Because you listen to them, you understand them, you're the only one that's really understood them, and that they trust you, and they've been looking for a man or a woman like you all their lives, now they finally found you. Um, will that happen? Yes, it will. It will. Now, in the past, in my career as a clinical supervisor, we've moved people around if that happens. But from your perspective, is it possible for you to fall in love with a patient? Or fantasize about uh, having a, engaging in a sexual activity? Fantasize about a patient. And, I'm, and you know the answer to that. Not because it's happened. <laughs> But you know that that could happen. You could it could come in your fantasy, okay? And that's good. That that is going to happen. So to be forewarned is to be forearmed. That is going to happen also. And you have to be cognizant of that and be able to handle that in a professional, ethical way. Okay, so. That's just two of the uh, two of the big ones that you don't want to get involved in. Okay, so this course is going to focus on the uh, ethics, but ethical decision making. How to make an ethical decision, a professional and ethical decision, based on this framework and based on the knowledge and professionalism 
that you have and some additional information, hopefully, that you're going to, I'm going to impart to you as, you move, as we move through this online course. Okay, so we started with virtue ethics as compared to a code of ethics. And then we're going to move on to the next part, which is the law. Okay? Legal ethical standards. That's where we're going to go next. Okay? And I'll see you there.